All right, let's go to Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to go through the first 35 chapters today. Why is that so funny? Maybe I'll go through the first 35 words today. Maybe. Um, do what? Yeah, she knows me. Um, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his, let me read the scripture and then we'll go to the Lord in prayer. We're going to start a study in Genesis. Genesis is the foundation of all of God's work. And I've been studying a lot of this whole UFO alien devils movement, because that's really what that is. It's devils. Uh, evil angels, fallen angels, whatever. And they have a plan to sort of take over the world. But the truth of it is, it is God's creation. God is the one who made it. God is the one who established everything. And when you think about God being the creator of everything, most people do not want to admit or believe in their mind that God is real and that God created everything. Because if they did, then they would realize that God has certain laws that man has to abide by. And if man doesn't abide by those laws, he's going to be in trouble. And I mean, think about it. Do butterflies ever violate the law of God? No. They do what butterflies are supposed to do. And God gave them no commandment other than what's in their DNA. But can people break the law of God? Oh, absolutely. All right. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light and there was light. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Father, we come to you and we thank you, dear God, for blessing us today. It's a beautiful day. We thank you, God, for family, for fellowship, uh, for gathering around the table of the Lord Jesus Christ to hear the words that he speaks to us. I pray, dear God, that tonight you would give me clarity in my thoughts you help me to teach lord what i believe that you have led me to teach uh from the pure word of god and father i pray dear god that you should bless all of those that are watching with us online pray god that you'd bless those who could not be here tonight some are in the hospital some are in the nursing home some are just various places i pray lord that you'd bless them give them encouragement open up the word to our hearts and our ears and our eyes and help us to see wondrous things, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Let me throw this out to you. We've read these verses. Um, how important is it, in your opinion, that people get the idea of God creating the universe instead of the universe just happening? How important is that, do you think? What effects does not believing in God being the creator, what effect do you think that has on people, on countries, nations, families, or whatever? What, how, what effect does that have on them, you think? Where they don't believe that God created the universe the way the Bible says he did it. What do you think are some of the ramifications of something like that? Huh? Huh? Low morals. Now explain that. Why, why would their morality be low? Amen. What she said was that if man doesn't believe in a God, that God created everything, then God is not, or man is not bound to and by the laws of God. Correctly? Because there is no law. According to that, if there's no God, there's no Ten Commandments, that was written by men. And so basically, and she's right, basically, if, when you don't believe in a God, then you don't believe that you're going to suffer eternal torment for wrongdoing. 
And if that's the case then, then you get to do literally whatever you want to do. But God has an, an encouragement here, especially to all the young people in this church and those of you watching online. God has a very special, um, I guess it's a commandment, but it's wisdom coming from God through Solomon. That while you're young, you remember your creator. While you're young. So now think about it. Prior to, let's say, the mid to late 1800s, public education, public schools in America would be more apt to teach that God was the creator of everything that is until Charles Darwin shows up. Darwin shows up and then all of a sudden now people are starting, the school teachers starting to believe it, scientists starting to believe it, everybody's starting to believe it, that the Bible's wrong. And that we did, we were not a special creation of God. We, we, uh, evolved from monkeys and the monkeys evolved from lizards and the lizards evolved from fish and the fish evolved from, from some little cell in a pool of goo that instantly, just instantaneously created itself. Okay. Um, we have a neighbor that lives close to us. And their yard is full of junk. Full of it. We drove past there last night and I said to Lisa, I said, how do they, how do they not see how bad that looks? You know, in their yard. And um, I can't remember your, your response. But anyway, I said the words tornado in a junkyard. And she said, what does that even mean? And I said, the idea of how we got here and how all of life with all of its DNA shows up on planet Earth, they say it's the equivalent of a tornado blowing through a junkyard. Junkyard, you already have scraps of things and pieces of things. And their conclusion is, is that a, if the tornado spins around for five million years in the same place, it will eventually organize all of those parts into one collective. That's what they want you to believe. So the children used to be taught Bible ideas about the creation, about the world, the universe, the stars, and the moon and the sun and so on. But after Charles Darwin, they started throwing in this idea that maybe God didn't make it the way the Bible said. And then they had the idea that there is no God. So God couldn't have created anything. So therefore, since there's nobody at the end of our life to answer to and give an account of what we did in our life, since there's nobody that way, then they can do whatever they want. Uh, I'm going to confess something. I watched while we were out of town, I watched part of the documentary that was made about Michael Jackson. It's called Leaving Neverland. And Michael Jackson, I absolutely believe every bit of this, he had an affection toward young boys. And they tried to sue him. Some of, some of the families tried to sue him and Jackson settled out of court so that no verdict, that he couldn't be found guilty. But now that he's dead, these people are coming out in the open and they've filmed this documentary interviewing the guys who are now men but were boys. And Michael would take them under the guise of they were good dancers, good entertainers, even at a young age. And so Michael Jackson said, let's bring, I'll bring them in and they can, I can work with them and I can get them hooked in with different places and they'll be able to make a lot of money. That was his cover story. But he builds Neverland so that, and you find out that every building on 2,500 acres of land in California, every building that's out there has some sort of room in it where Michael would take whatever boy he had at the time, no matter where he was on his Neverland place, no matter what building he was in, he had a place where he could molest those boys. And Michael said, 
to one of the boys, I prayed about this and God brought you into my life. He's saying that like a normal man would say to his potential wife. I believe God brought you into my life. That's the kind of talk he's doing. And my point is this. He's getting now what he deserves. He's getting what he deserves. Because numerous boys, he was, it, anytime he was seen in public, um, if, if it was done at the right time, the paparazzi, they call him, would take pictures of Michael Jackson with his arm around some 9, 10, 11 year old boy. And they talked about practically everything that Jackson did to them. Okay? It's absolutely nuts. So if you don't believe that there is a God that created this universe, then you believe, and I preached on the family this morning, then you believe that nothing that God institutes in his word really matters. So we can still be monkeys, just a higher form of monkeys. And there is no right and there is no wrong. It's just whatever you want to do, that's right for you. It may not be right for everybody else, but it's right for you. So go ahead and do it. That's the idea that comes into people's minds when they do not believe in a creator. Uh, turn to Revelation 4. Here's the answer to the question. Why was the creation created? Why was the creation created? JR, could you go down and get me a bottle of water? Do we have any water in the fridge? See if we have one. My mouth is real dry. Those allergies, that pollen's starting to get to me. So why, was the, why did God, and I, you, if you try to think about this, it'll blow your mind. What did God do before us? Where did God come from? Isn't that crazy? What did God do before he made the heavens and the earth? What did he do throughout eternity past or whatever? How did God, what did he do? Well, we don't know the answer to that. I don't, I've never read the answer to that in scriptures. But then the Bible tells us the reason why he made this creation of the entire universe. And yes, I absolutely believe that this earth is the primary and sole. Uh, it has God's attention always. I do not believe that there are other races of sentient beings, people who can see themselves, know about them, are self-aware. There's not a planet anywhere else in the universe where God is doing a different work in that planet, but he has this work that he does in this planet. I do not believe that for a second. Thank you, young man. You didn't spit in it, did you? See if it makes that sound. Ah! That's what I was waiting. Maybe I do need a cup holder here. There we go. So anyway, where was I going? Huh? Yeah, I don't believe that there's any other kind of life living on other planets. And NASA and the astronomers are looking into the skies and they're looking at stars and they notice that stars sometimes wobble a little bit. And so their theory is that there must be planets whose gravitational pull is pulling on that particular star or sun or whatever it is and causing it to move just a tiny hair. And so they're, now that they know what to look for, they're finding these planets all over the universe. But the idea is... I don't think God has other people living on those other planets like all the science fiction writers said. I believe that, that this earth is absolutely special and unique in all of the universe. Are there other planets? Absolutely. There's at least eight in our system. They, poor Pluto, they took him out. Poor Pluto. He was the cutest one. But he's always last. He was always slower than everybody else. But beyond Pluto, there are, there are, I can't remember the word for it, but all these little miniature planets floating, floating are out there. They're, they're not shaped quite in that ball shape and different things like that, but they're out there. 
I believe that the earth is the central focus of everything that God did. And that's what he says in Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So two things he created on day one. But the earth, absolutely, I am geocentric. And what I mean by that is, I do believe that the earth is the center of the universe. Okay, everything goes around this. That's what I believe. So now here's, here's why it was created. Revelation 4.10, the four and 20 elders fall down before him that sat on the throne. Uh, we know who that is. It's one. Because in Revelation 4, John was carried up into the spirit and he saw a throne and one sitting on the throne. Amen. I know who the one is. Uh, anyway, they, they, uh, they fall down before him that sat on the throne, worship him that lived forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the thrones, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Now, think about this. This is in the book of Revelation. And this passage tells you that God is not done creating. What else does God have to create besides this earth and this universe and us on it? What other thing does God have to create? Anybody know? New heaven and new earth. New heaven, new earth. And the new earth is going to be a lot better than the old earth. It's not, and we're not going to have sin all over us. Amen. So, was, and notice in uh, verse 11, O Lord, uh, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive how many things? Count them. Three. It's the rule of three. Glory, honor, and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And so the Bible's telling us that God created this universe for a reason. He created all of the beasts, all the fishes, all the birds. He created all the stars, which are the angels. And then he created on day six, he created man. And he created man in his image. And we'll get to that a little bit later on. But that's the purpose of it, is to bring pleasure to God. It's like... If I ever wrote a song, which I've never done, I've kind of maybe fooled around with a couple ideas in my head, but I'm not really much of a songwriter. But if I was a songwriter and I wrote what I thought was my best work and handed it to the musicians, the singers or whatever, and had them record it, I would hope to take great pleasure from what I created. Now, don't take this the wrong way about me. Sometimes I will go and watch a Watchman video broadcast by Mike Hoggard. And not because... Do what, Jared? Yeah. Well, God makes my eyes leak a lot, so my head won't do that. Okay? But the... the where was I going with that now? Oh, when I see that, and I see that... The green screen, Lindsay did the green screen right and she put the slides in in the right way and the sound sounds good and how I'm presenting the material looks good to me. I get a certain amount of pleasure from that because that's my work, that's my creation. Whether it's a, doing a roof or growing vines or Sterling used to weld and things like that. Joe destroys secrets. Yeah. You take a certain amount of pleasure in the things that you do, do you not? I learned the pleasure of walking out of a newly constructed house. When I walked into that house, there was just bare drywall on there. And by the time we were done, all of that drywall was covered up with texture, ceiling texture and paint. And I would look back and say, I feel a sense of satisfaction knowing that I did that and that I did the very best I could. So that's God. God created this whole universe for His pleasure and His benefit. That neck neat. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Psalm 104. You can turn to each one of these passages. I've only got 25 verses. Surely that's going to give us enough time. 
Psalm 104, 26. There go the ships. Ships are on the seas. Who made the seas? God did. Who put the salt in the ocean? God did. Now, I have a little theory. You want to hear my theory about seawater and why it's salty? If you look at salt in the Bible, salt is a representation of burning. So let's say you have a wound and somebody rubs salt in your wound. How does that feel? It stings like crazy. Amen. Okay. Where was I going with that one too? Man, I must be losing my mind tonight. Huh? Oh, no, here's what I was going to say. It's fire. Because if you put salt on a wound, how does it feel? Burns. So salt is related to fire. And my theory is, is that the, the oceans, the sea, is a representation of hell. And rivers and lakes that are freshwater, representation of heaven. He leadeth me beside what? Still waters. The largest bodies of water in this world is seawater. And we know then that God is going to do away with the sea. Because he, John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth were passed away and there was no more sea. So I think if you study the word salt in the Bible, you'll see it's related to fire and burning. So I think oceans are sort of a picture of hell, if that makes any sense. Where did the beast rise up from in Revelation 13? The sea, the burning, the fire. So I think that that's the meaning of the symbolism. Anyway, there go the ships. There's that Leviathan whom thou hast made to play therein. Leviathan was a fire breathing dragon. Go look in Job. Verse 27, these all wait upon thee that thou mayest give them their meat in due season. Who is it that feeds? Who is it? Once God created everything, God then maintains everything as well. So you know what I believe? I believe the data that is used to support climate change, that data is puffed up or trumped up. That it's not nearly as bad. Because back in the 70s, they called it global cooling. The earth was going to freeze over. Now it's global. Then it was global warming. The earth is going to get so hot, it's going to kill everybody. Now it's climate change. Yeah, hello. Yeah, changes every season. But these people don't want to believe in God. Okay. So anyway, back to the scriptures. These all wait upon thee that thou mayest give them the meat. Uh, in due season, that, um, verse 28, that, that thou givest them, that, that thou givest them, they gather. Thou openest thine hand, they are filled with good. So God not only created everything, but he maintains everything. Even for bad lost people. When you were lost, did you not eat? When you were lost, did you not breathe God's air that God created? Absolutely. So God created that for our benefit, but it is God's pleasure that he gets out of it. Um, verse 29, thou hidest thy face, they are troubled. Thou takest away their breath, they die and return to, the, to their dust, which is also true. Every creature that's on the land, when it dies, it is absorbed right back into the dirt. If it's not eaten, if it's eaten, let's say a bear, let's say a, uh, or let's say a turkey vulture. Them things are the ugliest things I've ever seen in my life. So you got a dead deer carcass out there and the turkey vultures are eating off of that. By the way, they pick the maggots out first. Yeah. Then they eat the meat. So maybe that carcass didn't have time to dissolve to go back to the earth. But the turkey vulture that ate that deer is going to die and go right into the earth. So it's going to work out no matter how it happens. Um, verse 30. Thou sendest forth thy spirit. They are created. And thou renewest the face of the earth. The glory of the Lord shall endure forever. The Lord shall rejoice in his work. So here we have something related to Revelation 4. We see in Revelation 4 that the creation was made for God's pleasure. 
And in Psalm 104, uh, the glory of the Lord shall endure forever. The Lord shall rejoice in his works. So the works that God made in this universe, God rejoices in that. Isn't that neat? God rejoices in that. Uh, Psalm 148, turn over there, a couple pages maybe. Well, I wish I'd get rid of this headache. Psalm 148, 1. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all ye angels. Praise him, ye him, all his hosts. Praise ye him, sun and moon. Praise him, all ye stars of light. How is that even possible? Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. And I go about, people ask me, people, some of the people ask me this in Fargo and, and in uh, Minnesota. They said, you know, pastor, we have loved ones that are going to different churches and using all these, um, using all these different weird Bibles and things like that. And they, they want me to sort of, uh, well, I lost track. I'm, that headache's making me not think right. Where was I going with it? Huh? Yeah, anyway. Back to the scriptures. Let them praise the name of the Lord for he commanded and they were created. He hath also established or established them forever and ever. He hath made a decree which shall not pass. So here again in this verse, God sent forth his... I think that's what I was thinking now. God sent forth his word and they were created. But if these people are reading all these other Bibles, that's not God's word. And God cannot create outside of the spoken word of God. So you look in Genesis, verse 3, God said, let there be light. Verse 6, God said, let there be a firmament. Verse 9, God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together. Verse 11, God said, let the earth bring forth grass. Uh, verse 14, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament. And so with me, what it was, was when I was going through this deal about which Bible to use, God sent forth his word to me and said, Mike, you know that this Bible is right. You know, it's right 100% of the time. So when God sent forth his word to me, it did exactly what God sent it forth to do. And that is turn my light on. But anyway, these people said they have relatives go to all these other churches and they follow all these Bibles and they want me to try to give them something that will change their mind and change their heart. And the only thing that I know that changes a person is when God speaks to them. Just like in my office that day when God said, Mike, this Bible is right. You know it is. I believe it. And I believed it right then and there. And then after that, God began to supply the evidence. So he said, he hath also established them forever and ever, and he hath made a decree which shall not pass. In other words, what God says happens. He commanded and they were created. So think about this. When eight people walked onto the ark, we know that they were all husband and wife. Noah and his wife and Noah's sons and their wives. And they were on that ark for a year. How come no babies were born? No babies were born. Okay? Why is it? God must not have wanted that to happen. But if God wants a child to be born, a child is going to be born. If God wants somebody saved, that person is going to be saved. Because when God sends out his word, it does not return back to him void. It does the thing that he sent it forth to do. So that's what that means. For he commanded and they were created. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. All you young people, get your Bibles out. I want you to see this verse or these verses. Ooh, thank you. I'll hang on to that. Um, young people, I want you to listen to this. 
Remember now thy creator. And it's, notice it's capital C. The Bible translators knew who this was. They knew it wasn't Satan. They knew it wasn't evolution. They knew that everything that is was created by Jesus Christ. In fact, hold your place there in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Turn to John chapter 1. I have it in my notes for this lesson that, <coughs> and let me get there. I have it in my notes that in this lesson, at some point, I'm going to talk about how God created evil things. Who created Lucifer? God did. But did God know at the time that he created him, even though Lucifer started out being the anointed cherub that covereth, now he's fallen because of his, did God know that? Absolutely. So in John, so God does, and I have this in my notes, God creates things that turn out bad. But it's all according to his purpose. So in, in uh, John chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Notice this phrase, in the beginning was the word. So when you start at Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, the word of God was before Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. And that's what that says. In the beginning was the word. When Jesus was talking about Abraham, okay, Jesus said, well, what did he say? Man, my mind's a blank tonight. Anyway. Rem huh? Yeah, before Abraham was, I am. Meaning that he had been exist in existence even before the creation and after the destruction of this world. God is always there. So, young people, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1. Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon, who was an old man at this time. He had reigned 40 years on the throne of Israel. And he had seen a lot of things in his life. And he had done a lot of things in his life. And a lot of things that he did was flat out wrong. But God allowed him to do it. So that he could send a warning out to people. That you are to remember something very important to you. Remember the creator. In the days of thy youth. So. The kids that are here. Our homeschooled kids. We homeschool them here. If they were to go to the public school, the public school would absolutely try to jam evolution down their throat. And who knows but what one of these young people might end up actually believing that. That's not unheard of. It's happened before. When I was in uh, 10th grade, uh, in my biology class, the teacher was teaching us all about, you know, evolution and this and that and the other. And I kept asking questions and a couple other kids in the class that I knew went to church. They were asking the teacher questions, too, because he believed that we evolved from, you know, he took that standard idea. And so what he did was he said, we'll have a classroom debate. We'll debate. We'll have somebody on one side giving their evidence and their idea why the universe did was not created. And it's 14 billion years old and all this stuff. And then we'll let somebody stand up and speak for the rest of the class on why they believe in creation. Todd, guess who they picked to be their creation guy? So I'm like, God, you're really going to have to show me something now. And I don't remember what I said, but I remember when I got done, I got a bunch of high fives from guys in that classroom. Hoggard, you did a good job. But I want you to think about it, guys. If you have a creator, that means you have to answer to that creator at some point in your life. You're going to have to ask, you're going to have to answer questions about things that you did, things that you believed in, things you didn't believe in. And most young people do not even believe that there is a God. They believe in a lot of other things, but they don't believe that 
that there is a God. And so because of that, they, that's why they act the way they act. So while you're young, it's important to know that God is your creator. You are the, the height of everything that God created. That's what man is. You're at the top of every food chain that there is. You can eat anything. You can eat squirrels, and I like squirrel. Deer, rabbit, turkey, cows, rattlesnakes if you want. Some people eat horses. But anyway, God has given that to us as a gift, and God created all of that. He gave this earth over to us and gave us dominion over it. So he says, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Get it settled in your mind and in your heart that God made you. God created you. You are very special and unique to God. But do it while you're young. Verse 2. Well, let me, let me finish verse 1. Remember now, now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them, while the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. And I, I remember um, Brother Lonnie Skiles, Sterling. Uh, I think it was Gloria that told me. He preached a message about Ecclesiastes chapter 1. And all of those things that are listed in there pertain to an old person. And if you keep reading Ecclesiastes chapter 12, you'll see while the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened. Because what happens as we get older with our eyes? I remembered several years ago that it dawned on me that something in the shade or the shadows, I don't see as well as I used to. And that bugs me. I have to have a lot of light shining down. I made crab rangoon stuffing last night. And I had to practically turn on every light in the kitchen just to be able to see okay, <laughs> what I was doing. But remembering the creator, and, and what I was saying was, the light, the moon, the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. He's talking about the eyesight. And if you look down that passage in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, he's using metaphors to describe old people. Because what, in most cases, once a person lives through their life, they've already developed their own ideas, philosophies, habits. They very seldom ever change. Buster did. Alva Montgomery, the man that he liked our church, started coming to our church. His wife wanted to be a member here. We knew she was saved because she was a sweet old lady, one of the sweetest ones we knew. But then he asked me on way out Sunday morning, one Sunday morning, he said, I want you to come over to my house and I'll fix you some iced tea and I want to talk to you about something. I said, okay. So I went over that Saturday and we talked about, he used to be a World War II guy on a submarine. He talked about everything on the sun. And then he said, I'm going to get to the question I was going to ask you. How can I know that I'm going to heaven when I die? And that floored me. That man was 77 years old. And a good man. Because when I preached his funeral, his daughters, they all came to me and they told me, they said, dad was, dad was awesome. Dad was, we never saw dad argue with mom. We never saw him this or that and the other. He was just a good guy. But he didn't go to heaven because he was a good guy. He went to heaven because he acknowledged that the, he was created by God and he had to answer to God. Amen? So, young people, you're going to be flooded by this world with evolutionary ideas. And they'll pull out data and show you skulls and bones that they say, that's from the Neanderthal man, that's from the Cro-Magnon man. Uh, this is from, I don't remember all the different men's that came, evolved from monkeys. I think what they're digging up is monkeys. Okay. But anyway, you're going to be confronted with information that might throw you off and say, well, maybe, maybe God created it, but he let it evolve. Well, that's not what he says. So he says, instill it in your mind and your heart while you're young. That there is a creator. God created the heaven. God created the earth. And God made it unique. God made it the center of the universe. And God put us in it. And we are his special. We are the ones who were made in the image of God. No other creature 
Does God say that about, but he says it about man. And I believe we're unique in this universe and we have to know our creator. I have been, um, in the past few days, I've been dealing a lot with um, UFOs and aliens. And Todd and I were talking in the office about some of these men that are promoting this alien agenda. There are people in this, in this, there are people in this country who have high ranking places in government that believe that the extraterrestrial aliens are coming down here to do us some good, to help us evolve to our next state. They absolutely believe that. And what I see in that is they're reaching out to heaven but they're reaching just short of where God is. And they're not honoring the creator. They're honoring the creation as their God. So remember the creator in the days of your youth. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 25. I'm going to try to move on. It's getting late. Isaiah 40, verse 25. To whom then will you liken me? Or, or shall I be equal? Saith the Holy One. There's nobody like God. Nobody like God. Lift up your eyes on high and behold, who hath created these things that, bright, that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by names by the greatness of his might. For he is strong in power. Not one faileth. When he said that bringeth out their host by number and calleth them all by names by the greatness of his might. That means God has a name for every angel that there is, but there is a unlimited amount of angels how does god even do that he's god he is god and he has a memory he remember i am bugged i bug myself because when people start coming here they tell me their name and in five seconds that name is gone and so the next sunday they show up i say i shake their hand and say wow it's, it's good to have you come back but i can't remember their name but yet God names all the angels and he knows all that. And the idea behind this is if God has the power to create everything that you see out of absolutely nothing. What kind of power can God have in your life to accomplish great results in you? Turn to Job chapter 38. I like this passage. This is God reminding Job. That everything that Job's going through, he might have been a little afraid that the devil just really has all the power. And so God is going to answer Job out of a whirlwind. And I think that's related to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Where, um, you know, I never did read John, did I? Did I? My head's all over the place. I don't know why. But anyway, in John chapter 1... Uh, verse 2, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. God created everything. God created the good angels. God created the bad angels. God put a, planted a tree of life in the midst of the garden. God planted a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God created that. And I'm going to show you a verse in the Bible that says it verbatim. But here's Job and, and God is dealing with Job about his attitude, and he says in verse 1, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. Now verse 4 is where he starts laying it on. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare. Who laid the foundation of the earth? God did. And the flat people think you can't have a foundation in a ball earth. Yeah, you can. It's called the ground. The, the rocks in the ground. That's the foundation. And God laid those foundations. He said, Job, where were you when, when all this is happening? You didn't even exist. That's the answer. Um, if thou hast understanding, verse 5, who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest, or who hath stretched the line upon it? And it's interesting that every, and I mean every single, Ocean navigator, air pilots, all of these different people 
for the last, I don't know how many years, have used the exact same coordinates measuring system as every other pilot in the world. No matter how they, what language they speak, no matter where they came from and whose ship they're steering, they all steer by the same lines because God built it that way. Okay? And he says, where were you when I did that? Verse uh, 6, whereupon are the foundations there fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone there? I, so you know what this Bible saying? The earth has a cornerstone. Who's the cornerstone? Think about it. He's the creator. Who hath laid the cornerstone thereof? Verse 7. And I believe, I personally believe, before I say this, let me ask you a question. When do you think the angels were created? What day of creation? Or were they there before God created the heavens and the earth? Huh? They were created, yeah. And, I, and I, I'm not disputing that. They were created, but when were they created? Were they created before God created the heaven and the earth or after God did that? You think after? Tell me why, somebody. Huh? At Genesis 1. Is that what you were thinking, Jared? He made the stars also. And so I think, and I had a, a preacher, uh, and he's a good guy, I love him. And he may have disagreed with me on this, but he seems to think, according to Job 38, uh, where in verse 6, whereupon are the foundations there fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof, when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now he seems to think, that the angels were created at, on the same day that God laid the foundations of the earth. I'm not sure I believe that. Because what I see is, let's see verse 7, when the morning starts. I see God asking the question previously in verse 4, where wast thou when? And then look at verse 7. The morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Where were you when that event happened? So that, that's what I think. And I agree with you guys. I don't think the angels were created until day. Because he created the sun, the moon, and the stars. And we know stars are angels. But also that number four always represents the spiritual realm. Always. We wrestling against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. And I believe they were created on day four. So how I read Job 38 is... Where wast thou when, verse 7, the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Where were you when, when that happened? Day 4, in my calendar, comes before day 6. So God didn't even create man when he created the angels. Um, verse 8, who shut, up, who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as it if it had issued out of the womb? The earth is always rendered in the Bible as a female. Her. She. Okay? And she has a womb that waters gush forth from that womb. Do they not, ladies? I mean, I was in the room with Lisa, but there's just some things I didn't want to see. So the earth, I think, is a, every human is a picture of the earth and the earth is a picture of every human in that it's a woman, has a womb, sea waters. And by the way, the uterine water has the same salt content as the oceans do. So it's a, it's a sea. You have a beast. When you gave birth, you had a beast rising up out of the sea. <laughs> Amen, sweetie pie? <laughs> okay. So anyway, let me, let me move through this. Uh, let's see, verse 8, or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as if it issued out of the womb? And that also could apply to the flood as well. When I made the cloud, the garment thereof, and thick darkness, a swaddling band for it. And that, I think, is related to Luke chapter 2 and Jesus wrapped in swaddling clothes. Verse 10, and break up for my, and let me throw this in for those who listen who might have been affected by the flat earth people. Because they're not going away. And, um, one of the uh, one of the arguments. Let's see if I can find my place. I got all my verses real small here. See if I can find my place again. 
Oh, the swaddling band. When you swaddle a baby, do you just lay a blanket on the top of them? Is that swaddling? How do you swaddle? Like a burrito. Only you just don't eat it. Or put it in the microwave. <laughs> but you wrap it up. It surrounds and envelops the baby. And I believe that God put a swaddling band around the globe earth. Instead of just laying clouds and thick darkness on top of the earth, God said he made a swaddling band for it to bind it. Because the baby's in, been in the belly nine months and he likes being all scrunched up. And when he's born, he's all splayed out. And he don't like that. That's why he cries. So the first thing they do is wrap him up real tight. And then he calms down because now he, because he was used to that. And that's how, that's one of the reasons why I do not believe the earth is flat. One other reason why I don't believe the earth is flat is that's stupid. All right. Anyway. Verse 10. And break up for it my decreed place and set bars and doors. And he said, hitherto shalt thou come, but no farther, further. And here shall thy proud waves be stayed. So Job, where were you when the waters pushed forth and he had to put a barrier around it? Where were you then? Verse um, 12, hast thou commanded the morning since thy days and caused the day spring to know his place? Aren't you glad? That you don't have to wake the world up. The sun will wake you up. Okay. So he's Job. Where were you when I instituted that? When I did that. Uh, let's see here. Verse 13. That it might take hold of the ends of the earth. That the wicked might be shaken out of it. That's going to happen in the future event. It is turned as clay to the seal. Now again some people say. That means it was flat. Because the seal is like on a king's ring and he stamps it on that hot wax and it when he pulls it off the wax is still on the paper and it's sealing the envelope and the wax dries pretty quickly and that and and it's flat but that wasn't how they made seals back when Job wrote this they made what they called cylinder seals round ones and they would roll that sealer anyway that's another reason why the earth's not flat. Uh, verse 15, and from the wicked their light is withholden, and the high arm shall be broken. Verse 16, hast thou entered into the springs of the sea? Or hast thou walked in the, in the search of the depth? Notice in verse 16, hast thou entered into the springs of the sea? Jesus, Jesus did that. He walked right across the top of the water. Or hast thou seen the doors of the shadow of death? Hast thou perceived the breadth of the earth? Declare if thou knowest it all. In other words, how wide, how, what's the circumference of the earth? Hast thou perceived the breadth of the earth and declare if thou knowest it all? Where is the way where light dwelleth and is for darkness? Where is the place thereof that thou shouldest take it to the bound thereof and that thou shouldest know the paths to the house of Israel? And so Job 38, I encourage you to read that because he's giving a description not of what he created, but how he did it. And maybe a little bit, you might get an understanding of why he created it. Isaiah 40, verse 28. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator, there's another place where creators capitalize. Talking about Jesus. Uh, here's something interesting. The word creator, there's four occurrences of it where the C is capitalized. Um, what was the other one? I just had it in my mind. Maybe I shouldn't have come to church tonight. I don't know. Anyway, oh, the judge, that's what it was. The word judge, you'll find it exactly four times in the King James Bible with a capital J, referring to Christ. Verse 29, he giveth power to the faint and even to them that have no mighty increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall, what's that word? Renew. Renew is a creation word. Because when we are born again, we are a new creature. And the word creature comes from the word creation. We are new creatures. Okay? And they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. You may have been battling, struggling, fighting, 
and you're tired and weary, you can't take any more. And then all of a sudden, God moves in and he takes over and God gives you renewed strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles and they shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. And that is related to the fact that God is your creator. So if you need something, if something's broken in your life or something is missing in your life, God can create it and God doesn't need things to create it out of. He has, he has the ability to create things out of nothing. Isaiah 41, 18, I will open the rivers and high places and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land of springs. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar, the shita tree and the myrtle and the oil tree. I will set in the desert the fir tree and the pine and the box tree together that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord hath done this and the Holy One of Israel hath created it. And that goes back to John chapter 1. Where the Bible is then describing for you who the Holy One is. The Lord is Jesus Christ. Because without Him was not anything made that was made. Let me um, move through some of this. I had a verse I wanted to get to the end on. Oh, here's God now. Turn it back to Genesis chapter 6. Yeah. Genesis chapter 6. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. Four things. One, two, three, four. For it repenteth me that I have made them. If God created it, and this earth and this universe is God's property, who has the right to destroy it? Only God. I've got Lindsay and I think Lisa now hooked on the show Live PD. Isn't that a cool show? Because they go out live and catch bad guys. Sometimes they go to a domestic dispute and the spouse will say, look what he did to the car. Look what he did. He got so mad that he beat the windows in of his car and broke the windows in the house with a sledgehammer. You know what the police says? There isn't a law that prohibits you from destroying your own property. There isn't a law that says you can't do that. Okay? It's your house, your car. You can wreck it if you want to. You can burn your house down if you want to. Just don't try to collect the insurance money because that is fraud. But it's your property. You can tear it down just like you built it up. And so here is God. And something to remember. Because one of these things that people always say. Why they don't follow the Bible. And they don't believe the Bible. And they think God's evil. Is God is so evil and so murderous. That he commanded his people. To go and kill other people. Simply because they didn't have God's religion. But that wasn't the reason. And if God created this universe, and he did, and created us, God then owns it because he created it. And if God created it, he has the right to destroy it if he wants to. And he's going to one of these days. God had the right over his creation to destroy the creation because it all turned out bad and then Psalm 51, and we're going to leave you with this. Create in me a clean heart. O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not, cast me not away from thy presence, O oh Lord. I like that song. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. So, you have people sitting in churches that do not believe the Bible tells the truth about the creation. There was a man, I'm not going to say his name, but all through the years that I was growing up in this church, every pastor that we had tried to go to this man. He was a high school science teacher and didn't believe in God. And so every preacher that was here went to this house, this man's house, to try to win him over and lead him to the Lord. And he wasn't doing it, period. 
Well, they moved down south and they went to a church down there. And I know the pastor. He's a good, good guy, good pastor, good preacher. Uh, it's where uh, Bradley is now. So they moved down there because they both retired. And lo and behold, he quote unquote gets saved. And he starts going to church. Baptized the whole bit. So then the preacher, Brother Larry Allison, started preaching Genesis 1 and the creation. And that man left that church red-faced anger. And he told the pastor, how can you be so ignorant as to teach that kind of garbage? We've proven this over and over that nothing of what God said in Genesis 1 is even true. I mean, how is it that he created light, but then he didn't create a son until four days later? So they, so this man, this man immediately rejected the word of God. And now he's dead. He chose a church where he knew they would not teach stuff like that. And now he's dead. I'm not his judge, but I often wonder, I wonder where he went. Because essentially, because he had this esteemed knowledge, he was calling God a liar. And God is not a liar. You can't call God a liar. I wouldn't call God a liar to his face. But show me a place where his face does not exist. So if you want God to create in you a clean heart, God has a method of cleaning hearts. And that method goes all the way back to Genesis 1. And I preached a sermon several... It's been a long time since I preached this sermon. But it's basically how the, the creation week in Genesis 1 shows us how we are saved. On day one, it's void and, and um, darkness on the face of the deep. When, you, when you're lost, there's void in your life and there's darkness in your life. But then God comes along, Jared, and says, God said, let there be light. Four words. And there was light. So young people, and even us old people, don't fall for the lies. Trust this Bible. Create in me a clean heart. If you want God to create a clean heart in you, then I would say you would have to believe that God is the, the creator God and the only creator God. You don't want your heart over a million years to evolve into a perfect state. You want God to change it right then and right now. Amen.